Und dementsprechend begrüße ich Sie ganz herzlich, meine Damen und Herren, zum äh, sechsten BPB-Forum Digital. Und ich begrüße Sie im Namen der Bundeszentrale für politische Bildung und ich tue das ganz bewusst noch auf Deutsch, tatsächlich um die Brücke zu schlagen von unserem äh, gewohnten Veranstaltungssetting, ähm, was wir normalerweise im BPB Medienzentrum ähm, im Analog äh, und digital sozusagen äh, haben, äh, um die Brücke zu schlagen zu unserem äh, heutigen zu unserem heutigen Abend, zu unserem heutigen Vortrag. Denn ähm, heute trauen wir Ihnen eine rein englischsprachige Veranstaltung zu, ohne Übersetzung und äh, doppelten Boden, weil wir das Ganze nämlich, dieser Abend ist eingebettet in eine Vortragsreihe mit dem Titel The White House Embedded, the US Election 2020, mit der wir ähm, auf, uns auf die Präsidentschaftswahlen in den USA einstimmen wollen. Das tun wir schon seit... Frau Silke, März, glaube ich, ne? oder Mai, nee, meine ich, seit Mai. 28. April. Ach, seit April, da, irgendwas dazwischen, genau, seit April, sehr gut. Seit April stimmen wir uns auf die US-Wahlen äh, im Herbst ein. Diese Reihe ist realisiert worden tatsächlich vom Nordamerika-Studienprogramm der Universität Bonn in Kooperation mit dem Amerika-Haus Nordrhein-Westfalen und uns, der Bundeszentrale für politische Bildung. Und insgesamt gab es zehn Vorträge, glaube ich, ne? einer ist ausgefallen, mhm. die sich mit äh, Trumps Präsidentschaft, Wirtschaftskonzepten, amerikanisch-chinesischen Beziehungen, dem Phänomen Populismus, den Republikanern, Demo dem, den Demokraten und ganz viele mehr beschäftigt haben. Und federführend für diese ganze Reihe ist Sabine Silke, Herzlich willkommen. Sie ist Professorin für Literatur- und Kulturwissenschaften und leitet das Nordamerika-Studienprogramm und das Deutsch-Kanadische Zentrum an der Universität Bonn. Und weil sie heute Abend ihre Speakerin ist, stelle ich sie noch ein kleines bisschen ausführlicher vor. Sabine Silke ist nämlich seit September 2001 bereits Inhaberin des Lehrstuhls für Literatur und Kultur an der Universität Bonn. Und von 2004 bis 2012 leitete sie auch das Forum Frauen- und Geschlechterforschung der Rheinischen Friedrich-Wilhelms-Universität. 2005 hat sie dann das Zentrum für Kulturwissenschaft, Cultural Studies ähm, der Universität Bonn mitbegründet, für das sie von 2012 bis 2018 als Sprecherin auch fungierte. Stipendien und Fellowships brachte sie unter anderem, brachten sie unter anderem an die Duke, Brandeis, Harvard und die New York University und die University of Toronto und die University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Kanada. Sowie an die University of Queensland in Brisbane und die University of New South Wales in Sydney. Sie sind sehr viel rumgekommen, <lacht> Frau Silke. Sie war beratend für das Center for Modernist Studies der Seijing University in Hangzhou in China tätig und äh, ist assoziiertes Mitglied an mehreren äh, Verbandsprojekten und äh, hat selbst Projekte zu Formen und Funktionen von Nostalgiephänomenen, Wissenschaftsökologien Nordamerikas und Mimikry als Kommunikationsform initiiert. Seit 2016 engagiert sie sich als Vertrauensdozentin der Stiftung der Deutschen Wissenschaft. And now we will switch in English and please welcome with me Professor Sabine Silke. She will talk about how gender matters in 2020 presidential election. And I'm very, very happy about this topic because we usually discuss economic concepts and foreign policies and we pretend that gender doesn't matter at all. And I will really hope we will be much wider <laughs> at the end of this evening. And before I, I, I hand over to you, I just let me say a last word about the possibility to participate in this evening today. So um, if you would like to make a comment or would like to, um, or you have a question or something like that, please use the chat function at Zoom. So we will, uh, I, can, I can ask your question. And if you would like to, to be present in this evening and to, uh, you would like to, to ask your, your, question, uh, your question yourself, um, please hold your hand. Uh, this is also a function in Zoom. I, I'm sure you know this and uh, I can, and put on your microphone and your camera. So because you, you all know sometimes the stabi st stability of the, of the network is not so, uh, so good. <laughs> so please uh, uh, let your cameras and, and microphones off so that we will make this evening all together tonight. So please Sabine Silke, welcome. You, it's, it's your evening. You, welcome on stage. <laughs> 
Thank you very, very much, uh, Ms. Hoff, uh, for that kind and very generous introduction. Uh, and I would like to say a warm welcome to everybody who's taking part uh, in this actually final event in our lecture series, the White House and Battle of the US Election 2020. And this is therefore also my last chance, at least for this summer, to once again express my gratitude to all cooperation partners, the Bundeszentrale für politische Bildung and the America House in Cologne. And I thank in particular Christoph Müller-Hofstede and Anna Hoff at the Bundeszentrale and Dr. Benjamin Becker and Katharina Kiefel at the America House for all their support. Um, I won't uh, say much uh, by way of introduction, um, but I would like to just let you know that this talk, of course, relates to one of my long-standing stand research interests. And i um, like to briefly explain um, two concepts of gender because my own PhD thesis and my postdoctoral project evolved in two different moments of gender studies. Um, the first uh, book uh, came out of work in the 80s. Uh, it's on women's poetry and French feminist theory. And at that point in time, gender was understood as a parameter of difference and focused very much on women as being different from men. My postdoctoral project, which is a book on um, the rhetorics of sexual violence, is much more set in the 90s and sort of informed by um, the notion of gender that was developed by Judith Butler, and that is more a relational concept and an understanding of gender as cultural construction. Um, and I'm saying all that because both of these understandings um, uh, inform work in gender studies these days. So none of it is obsolete and it's quite interesting to see that um, issues of difference and feminism are resurfing in a, in a particular way. I'm now working also on the Me Too movement among other matters which, which were already mentioned. More specifically, my contribution tonight addresses the question why the United States has not yet managed to inaugurate a female president. And I just realized that I need to uh, go to my PowerPoint presentation, which I want to share with you. Okay, almost forgot about that. Um, and I do need to, just a moment. Okay. Yeah, that should be fine. Yes. Okay, we have moved. I'm so sorry. I have to go back. Um, oh, wait. Hmm. Wir haben es gerade gesehen. Er muss, ja. da ist sie. Jawohl. Ja, aber, aber it's not moving. That's sort of, oh, okay. So, okay. Let's, let's take a step back. So, uh, my, my talk tonight addresses the question why the United States has not yet managed to inaugurate a female president. How come the majority of Americans believe that none of the former female Democratic contestants ranging from Pamela Harris to Amy Klobuchar, to Elizabeth Warren, could be Trump. And what it says about the US American political culture and conceptions of leadership that in November 2020, voters choice will be between two controversial men in their 70s, both of whom, interestingly enough, face allegations of sexual violence against women. My answers interrogate, among other ma matters, the seriality of feminism, the institution of presidency in the United States, and the current retrotopian self-conceptions of US American culture, by which I mean current notions of US American culture that are infused by imaginary versions of the past. My talk also reflects how the urgency of race matters, as well as matters of class, impact on and interdependent with gender matters. My talk comes in two parts. 
in part one entitled Not Ready Yet, the Seriality of Feminism, the Gender of Misogyny, and the Case of Hillary Clinton, I re-engage the last presidential race and the historical defeat of Hillary Clinton, which has in multiple ways framed the current race for the upcoming election. In part two, repetition with variation, my focus is on gender matters during the democratic primaries and on Biden's choice of a female running mate. And I will be reading my talk, so bear with me. Um, and I, uh, I thank you for your patience uh, already. So part one, not ready yet. Let me begin with a seemingly simple question. All over the globe, female political leaders in highest office have ceased to be an exception. Why then has the United States with a culture that gave rise to a highly influential women's movement and a strong tradition of feminist activism and theory not yet managed to inaugurate a female president. Some suggest that with Eleanor Roosevelt, America has already had a female president, but that does not really count, of course. And why has the US presidency remained a male domain, even though women are still un represented in US politics have consistently been elected into exposed political offices over the last 40 years. In fact, they have run for the office since 1872 when Victoria Woodhull did, knowing, of course, that she stood no chance. This seeming paradox can in part be explained by the US American political system, the very institution of the presidency by dominant conceptions of leadership, the dynamics of presidential rhetoric, the media coverage of electoral processes, and of course, by the particular normativity of gender relations in the US and the persistent inequality of sexes all over the globe. Fact is that central claims of liberal feminism, such as equal pay and gender parity in political representation, are by no means obsolete. And as part partial achievements, they are not irreversible either. Like so many emancipatory moves, the hard ones of feminism do not progressively add up. Instead, they follow patterns of recursion and seriality as we move two or three steps forward today and two steps back tomorrow. As a consequence, things do change, but they do so very slowly. Unexpected, as it was to many observers, the defeat of Hillary Clinton by Donald Trump certainly felt like such a regression. More than that, in the United States, I hold feminism a movement that has had to repeat its main critique and arguments for hundreds of years. And while interrog interrogating misogyny provoked more of it, feminism is part of the legacy of a compromised American democracy that Hillary Clinton challenged, as did many others, including Kirsten Gillibrand in the recent primaries. The fact that feminism is back on the agenda, most visibly perhaps with the Me Too movement, while democracies seem to turn into an endangered species, this certainly amounts to a mixed blessing. In times of revitalized sex, sexism, racism, xeno, homo, and other kinds of phobia, the reiteration of seemingly rusty feminist claims receives a new function. Rather than driving divisions, it reaffirms the equality of men and women. At the same time, the very fact that the opponents in the last presidential race were an old school feminist and a new school misogynist slash racist has pushed gender difference back into the foreground. In contrast, two male candidates running against each other, as in all previews, in the upcoming election make for a competition between versions of masculinity. Both the last and the upcoming election thus highlight in quite dramatic ways how persistent traditional gender ideologies and as a consequence, 
ongoing feminist interventions have remained. More specifically, the 2016 presidential election with all its Hillary hating, pussy grabbing and trumping that bitch also brought forth and affirmed the unbroken persistence of a contempt for ambitious women in politics. A contempt that many voters, both women and men, seem to accept and tolerate, if not applaud and cheer. Many observers, this one included, mistakenly believed that the United States were ready to elect a woman president and that political experience and professional competence would secure Clinton's victory. Instead, we witnessed a campaign during which misogyny and sexism became both a central issue and socially presentable again, just as Barack Obama's presidency ushered back in explicit and outspoken racist remarks on a large scale. Why, many wondered, did 41% of all women who went to the polls in 2016 vote for Trump, whose presidential campaign was supposedly deemed to failure because women saw him as a misogynist and worse? Let us briefly recall, even though more women than men voted for Clinton, 52% of white women voted for Trump. Among them, he received the strongest support, 61%, from white women without college degrees. Somewhat more surprisingly, white women with college degrees made up the second large and largest contingent of women supporting Trump. 44% of this group voted for him. While some may have been attracted to Trump's fiscally conservative policies, Research suggests an even more pervasive gender dynamic at play. Moreover, white women's backing of Republicans for president over Democratic candidates is by no means a new trend, but consistent with previous elections, as Eugene Scott underlines. Most white women, 56%, voted for Romney in 2012, and most white women without degrees back the GOP presidential nominee in every presidential elections since the year 2000. In 2016, a vote for Trump may indeed have voiced a desire to reaffirm traditional gender roles. At the same time, the highly polarized race also raised questions of the gender of misogyny. Since hatred or dislike of or prejudice against women, and this is the definition of misogyny, has been written into our cultures and mindsets by philosophical discourses as much as by the practices of our own daily lives, misogyny, like racism, is not necessarily blatant. In fact, much of it is subtle and goes unnoticed, ingrained as it is into heteronormativity. This is why misogyny is not just a male thing, but a mindset and an, ideolo and an ideology we all inherit. It affects all political systems and also feeds anti-feminism. Associating leadership with a particular version of masculinity, which make America great again, businessman Trump seems to embody, his female supporters were also more critical of those who do not fit their image of success. Accordingly, although Clinton won the popular vote, exit polls suggested that more people cast their vote against her than against Trump. Among them were a group of voters named Bernie Bros for brothers, whose support for Sanders relied on their dislike of Clinton. They could not swallow their candidate's loss and agreed with Trump that the system is rigged and Clinton belongs in prison. These Bernie fans either did not vote at all or voting for Trump helped to secure his victory. And of course, the Bernie brothers are still around. 
What most of the research suggests is that stereotypes and traditional notions of gender prevail, as does bias against women by women, reinforced by a media ecology that impacts our perception in persistent ways. At the same time, an interesting departure from these trends emerged from the voting patterns of women of color and black women in particular. 25% of Latinas voted for Trump and just 4% of all black women did. It is these black women in particular that Biden now aims to address. All in all, it is way too simple to hold as many did and still do that the US was not ready for female president because Hillary Clinton was not the right candidate. The claim, this claim clearly bypasses the fact that once a woman enters the presidential race in the United States, issues of personality and politics get overdetermined by a gender bi bias of systemic proportion, a bias which also took its toll during the recent primaries. The very fact that we fuss so much about Clinton and other female candidates aspiring to the office of commander in chief underlines that the presidency is a truly masculinist institution. An institution which from its very beginning established close ties between presidency and property, ties that Trump, Trump blatantly impersonates. In the US, serious political ambition has its price. Congress is overpopulated by millionaires and no man or woman without means could even think about entering the presidential race. With a streak of 44 consecutive more or less property men to serve, the office of the president has established itself with no variation, Meredith Conroy notes, as a man's domain. Not that women did not protest this boy's network from the very beginning, as did Abigail Adams in her famous 1776 letter to her husband, John, who served as the United States first vice president and second pres president. And I'm gonna read this um, uh, to you just briefly, um, what Ab Abigail Adams wrote. I long to hear that you have declared an independency and by, the very, by way in the new code of laws, which I suppose it will be necessary for you to make, I desire you would remember the ladies. Do not put, put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice. Accordingly, women ran for the office of the president long before they themselves were able to vote, as Woodhull did, along with her running mate, of abolitionist Frederick Douglass, on the Equal Rights Party ticket in 1872. She won zero votes. Since then, over 30 women have gained the nomination of minor parties, such as the Socialist Worker Peace and Freedom and the Green Party. Exact, exactly 100 years after Woodhull's pitch, Shirley Chisholm became the first black candidate to seek the Democratic Party's presidential nomination, eight years after US Senator Margaret Chase Smith ran in vain for the Republican nomination in 1964. Chisholm's chilly, chilly reasoning was, I ran because somebody had to do it first. Interestingly enough, member of Congress and governor positions have been a different matter altogether. Janet Rankin of Montana became the first woman to win the congressional seat and served twice from 1917 to 1919 and from 1941 to 1942. The first 
female senator Rebecca Latimer Felton from Georgia was elected in 1922 and served for only one day because the term ended. Nellie T. Ross of Wyoming, Wyoming was the first female governor succeeding her deceased husband and serving from 1925 to 1927. In 1968, Chisholm of New York became the first African-American woman elected to the House of Representatives. Nancy Landon Kassebaum, a Republican from Kansas, in 1978 was the first woman elected to the Senate without being preceded in Congress by her husband. Um, was there, is there a problem? Is there a problem? Frau Hof? Ja, es ist kein, also es ist kein, eigentlich sind alle stumm geschaltet außer Sie, deswegen wundere ich mich, dass es, normally everybody is silent. Ab, um, okay. I, I, I think it's fine. I just, you can just continue. You can hear me, okay? I, we can hear you wonderful. No okay. problem. Fine. Okay. So meanwhile, uh, women are also very well represented at higher levels of government in the state, yet interestingly enough, much more poorly at lower levels. Considering the radical changes in women's political representation in the last decades, it is surprising as work on media bias and presidential campaigns suggests that reporting on women running the race has not changed more. Female candidates research shows receive less coverage by major news organizations than men. Media generally treat women less seriously than their male competitors and prefer to focus on female candidates who are likely to succeed, who are unlikely to succeed rather than those who, who stand a fair chance. Moreover, in, in women, political ambition as any other raises suspicion. If women in high office prefer not to come across warm-hearted, emotional, and open, whatever that means, commentators are, are likely to complain. On top of it all, ageism preys on women more than it does on men. In the 2016 presidential race, Clinton's age at 69 supposedly disqualified her more than Bernie Sanders at 75 or Trump who turned 70 in June 2016. In fact, it's even more nauseating. Women are often too young, too inexperienced, not ready, right up to the very moment they are past their prime, an argument that has been made about Warren too. By contrast, their male colleagues just turn elder statesmen. As a result, even though voters are willing to cast ballots for female candidates, Sue Thomas underlines, they still stereotype candidates by sex. And most important, gender stereotyping matters more in races for the presidency of the United States than any other office. The fact that gender stereotypes persist and are both challenged and perpetuated by the media makes female candidates calibrate their public presence in ways that counteract prejudiced views. This takes different forms. Women in male domains may in fact act in ways that are considered more masculine. They may as well though begin to emphasize supposedly feminine manners. This is risky business. The reinforcement of stereotypically gendered behavior is for obvious reasons advantageous for men, yet debilitating for women. Moreover, as commentators note, many women and men buy into the false dichotomy that a woman leader can be either competent or likable, but not both and more on likability in a moment. Moving in public, thus has been a balancing act, a tightrope walk for Clinton as it was for all female candidates running 
in the democratic primary and testing a range of political personas to preempt gender bias. Tulsi Gabbard highlighted her record in the military. Amy Klobuchar made her legislative achievements and her success and winning offices in the Midwest the centerpiece of her campaign. And like Klobuchar, Warren presented herself as a team player and a Paul to have a beer with. And there are many picture, uh, photographs of Warren having a beer on the internet. It was really hard to choose, so, but I like this. So I come to part two, uh, which is entitled Repetition with Variation, Gender Matters During the Democratic Primaries and the Choice of a Running Mate. After Hillary Clinton's defeat and the Women's March on Washington on the 21st of January 2017, the day after the inauguration, many observers actually feared that it had become even more difficult for women to be nominated as presidential candidates once again anytime soon. And as we know now, they were right. Yet hope was rising in 2018 when the midterm elections voted numerous women into high offices and Congress. When 41% of white men voted Democratic and when 23% more women than men voted for women. So the midterms were seen as three steps forward. And uh, you see here, um, uh, the uh, women who won races and replaced male uh, 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 contestants um, in that uh, midterm election. And here we have a couple of the, uh, the women who came in first um, uh, as senators um, and governors in, in their states. And optimism prevailed. By 2019, for the first time in history, six highly qualified women were running for the presidency. While the far field of more than 20 contestants also said something about the state of the Democratic Party, as did the large group of aspiring Republicans in the 2016 primaries, some commentators were confident that in 2020, the highest and hardest glass ceiling will be shattered once and for all. Enter 2020, wrote Jessne Horror, may the best woman win. And this is, is exactly what Warren believed too. In a town hall meeting on 5 February 2020, Warren was asked about women's odds and beating. Trump. Referencing the midterms, Warren was very confident and ended her response as follows, and I quote, in 2020, we can and should have a woman for president. I was, would like to show you that video. It's quite interesting to look at it, um, but it doesn't work uh, in, in Zoom. So uh, you may go back to the uh, YouTube video on that particular town hall meet meeting because there was so much confidence uh, even in February of this year. As we know by now, we won't have a woman for president. By March 19, the day Tracy Gabbard suspended her campaign, all female contestants had dropped out of the race, leaving the stage to two men or three, if we count in Sanders. Now, what dynamic made all female candidates, including Warren, drop in the polls uh, to single digits? And why were three out of six hopefuls back in the short, back a couple of weeks later, back on the short list for the position of vice president? First, on to the primaries and the process of nominating a presidential candidate a process which depends on multiple parameters, ranging from a candidate's funds 
to political record, appeal and public appearances, to media salience and polls. Like Clinton, women in the current race had to deal with sexist remarks, as well as with versions of the proverbial, I just don't think she has the presidential look, now launched primarily against Warren. Once again, there was less media attention to women, and once again, female candidates received more negative courage than the male rivals, who were praised for once playing in a punk band, as was Vito O'Rourke, or for speaking Norwegian and outstanding finger food eating abilities, as Buttigieg was. Experienced female candidates and the front runners had a combined 40 year elected experience in Congress, also tend to get tougher questions, thus have to deliver answers which may make them look less appealing or likable. As a consequence, so Debbie Walsh notes, the idea of women in leadership is still often met with the shrug of, I don't know if we can go there. In these primaries, though, matters turned out even more simple. Common sense became that no woman was capable to win against Trump. And the signpost, no, no, no woman need apply, turned into a self-fulfilling prophecy. As Melissa Miller observes, and I quote, once convinced that a woman can't win, folks don't vote for a woman, thus ensuring that a woman doesn't win, and the cycle continues. The reality is, Miller adds, that a woman can win Hillary Clinton's victory by about 3 million popular votes in 2016 made that clear. End of citation. So while back then Clinton was the problem, this time around it was Trump. And of course he is. Despite his complete incompetence, the incumbent was projected as so unbeatable that even Democratic voters ready to cast their vote for a woman came to believe that it needed a man to do the job. But was it indeed Trump's greatest trick to convince voters that women can't win the election, as Pima Levy suggested in January 2020? In part, it was since Trump had doubled down on misogyny and engaged in an unprecedentedly strange performance performance of the presidency aimed at consolidating the office as a man's job. However, media polling methods and democratic contenders sure lend him a helping hand. Let's consider Levy's example. In November 2019, the New York Times polling savant Nate Cohn appeared on The Daily, the newspaper's podcast, to shed light, as she puts it, on the biggest question of the Democratic presidential primary. Who actually, who's actually electable in 2020? Just when Warren had climbed to the top of the polls, Cohn declared her a weak nominee since some voters wouldn't support a woman. His insight relied on a poll conducted by the New York Times, measuring the chances the Democrat top, Democratic top candidates had against Trump in the closely contested states Clinton lost in 2016. That poll had Warren look shakier than Sanders and Biden. The message seemed unmistakable to some. Warren, just as other women, were risky choices. And wasn't Warren also too angry as Biden himself suggested and therefore less likable than he was? In fact, the poll itself had included the question whether voters favoring Biden or Sanders found the five remaining female candidates likable, a yes or no question that in case you dislike one but none of the other four could not be ad answered adequately. Nonetheless, 41% responded was no, and not likable was read as not electable. 
Such polls not only scare voters for no reason, rather than demonstrating latent sexism among voters, political scientist Kathleen Dolan holds, they are themselves an insidious form of sexism. If that was not enough, two months later on 13 January 2020, CNN reported that at a dinner in December 2017, as both Warren and Sanders were preparing to launch presidential campaigns, Sanders told Warren that a woman couldn't wait. On the following day, 14 January 2020, the incident moved center stage in a dispute between Warren and Sanders during the Democratic presidential debate in Des Moines, Iowa. Warren accused Sanders, Sanders denied, and no matter who was right, their clash reinforced what was slowly turning into consensus. A woman won't win. Even if at issue was, was not Warren's womanhood, but her Medicare for all plan, the very sense that others may not vote for a woman apparently encourages potential voters to favor male candidates. By Valentine's Day this year, Warren was struggling, as the New York Times put it. So this may, after all, indeed be Trump's greatest triumph over women, as Levy puts it, a certainty that a woman cannot defeat him or any other male candidate. It's not true, she comments, but it can be believed into existence. Or maybe, and this is my addition, there's method in this madness. After Warren was done, the imperative became to stand with feminists for Bernie, most refused, Naomi Klein commented on Twitter. They did in part because gender matters and women, women's issues ranging from equal opportunity and equal pay to reproduction healthcare are absent from Sanders' political leftist agenda, an agenda which, which rests on the outdated assumption that socialism takes care of gender divides somewhat automatically. The problem though is not so much that Sanders like Trump and Bill Clinton capitalize on economic matters, but that they fail to acknowledge that the economy, like society generally, is structured by gender and race, and that accordingly, racism and sexism are bound up with economic concerns. Thus, even though gender matters are economic matters, they are relentlessly marginalized in favor of economic and national security issues. And the question whether gender matters are secondary or a structuring force remains a dividing issue within the Democratic Party. No surprise, therefore, that while presidential candidates answer hundreds of questions about the economy, they are rarely asked about the econo economic issues that most directly affect women. Needless to say that when the candidates were interviewed about the issues that matter to working women by Fortune magazine and Time's Up in January 2020, candidates were all in favor for paid family and medical care, safe and affordable child care for addressing and preventing sexual harassment, for closing the pay and opportunity gap, and for more women and other underrepresented group, groups on corporate boards. Kamala Harris had an ironic take on the matter. When asked to talk about women's issues, she likes to reply, I'm so glad you want to talk about the economy. Of course, it's not much easier for feminists to rally around Joe Biden either. As the New York Times reported on 29 April 2020, progressive activists and women's rights advocates are in intense standoff with Joe Biden over his silence on a sexual assault allegation by Tara Reid. 
Breaking this silence, the main defense of the Biden campaign has been to point to his engaged fight against sexual violence, and in particular, his role in the 1994 Violence Against Women Act, which was part of the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act passed by the Clinton administration. Back then, being tough on crime was one of the Democrats' attempt to appeal to Republicans and meant, among other steps, funding 100,000 additional cops and 125,000 prison cells. Still, a vote against the bill was calibrated as a vote against women. Biden's defense strategy highlights how long he has been around. After all, this is his third bid on the presidency. Interestingly enough, however, it is partly age and deja vu that drive Biden's success. The fact that in November 2020, voters' choice will be between two controversial white men in their 70s, therefore raises the question that Derek Thompson voiced in The Atlantic in March 2020. Why do such elderly people run America? In January 2021, he writes, the three people most likely to be the next president, Biden, Sanders, and the incumbent Donald Trump, would each be the oldest president to ever give an inaugural address in American history. All born in the 1940s, he adds, they are divided by ideology, yet united by dotage. Now, people are living to an older age in the US as well as in Europe, but this preference for old guys is an American thing. High-ranking politicians around here are currently considerably longer, younger. Think of Johnson, who is 55, and Macron, the exception, of course, at 42. American leadership is old folks, all the way down, Thompson notes, and the American government, and I quote, is a creaky machine whose most crucial cogs could be generously described as vintage, end of quote. So how come? One reason may be the disengagement of younger people from the electoral process. The medium voters age in municipal elections is 57 nearly a generation older than the median age of eligible voters. Moreover, while Americans who are 55 and older make up one third of the population, they own two thirds of the nation's wealth, the highest level of wealth concentration on record. In addition, wealthy and healthy elderly are also working longer as Sanders and Biden third do. Trump, we hear, takes a more leisurely approach, coming to the office around noon to have a burger and watch TV. Now, how about Biden's bit as déjà vu? Since his political experience and record as vice president in the Obama administration have legitimized Biden's most certain nomination, his status as frontrunner also foregrounds what I consider the retrotropian dynamic that informs the current US, US American politics of both the Democrats and the Republicans. And I take my cue from Sigmund Baumann's last book, Retrotopia. Trump's infamous desire to make America great again references, so Trump himself explained, the late 1940s and 50s. A pre-civil rights Jim Crow America, I may add, during which the lines between genders and races seemed clearly cut and white supremacy appeared to rule smoothly. It is this memory of a time that never was that drives Trump and his base more and more openly these days. The Democrats, by contrast, like to recall the miracle of the Obama presidency as much as the political momentum of the 1960s. The fact that African-American voters favor Biden became an even greater advantage during the recent protests against po police violence and systematic racism that is always referred 
back to and, and compared to um, uh, similar protests in the 60s. Evidently, the current political climate drives Biden's choice of a running mate, a decision, a decision that usually has no more than a trivial impact on the outcome of an election, as commentators tend to agree. However, in this current historical moment, Biden's pick is deemed of utmost importance for voter turnout. Attracting voters over 45 and losing those under 45 to Sanders, Biden needs to mobilize younger voters as well as both black and white women of all ages. There are a number of women who are qualified to be president tomorrow. I would pick a woman to be my vice president, Biden announced in March and people started to make lists even before he began interviewing potential candidates. And in fact, um, we only had two vice presidential candidates so far, um, Geraldine Ferraro and Sarah Palin. And these are um, the women that are now in the discussion. Looking for women qualified to be president tomorrow, Biden obviously acknowledges who, that whoever will be running him late, later this year may also be running the race in 2024, if not taking over his post even earlier. But why pick a woman now, I wonder, if previously it was simply assumed that voters would not turn out for a woman in the presidential race? And why do the same women who did not make the cut during the primaries, Warren, Harris, and Klobuchar, now qualify for the VP position? And Klobuchar has declined in the meantime, as we know. It looks like women are invited in once again as crisis managers. A common move during a, downtown in a downturn in business or a political squeeze. In such situations, the likelihood of failure is most pronounced and the proverbial glass ceiling easily turns into a glass cliff. Remember the nomination of Clinton? That was sold by California Governor Jerry Brown, among others, as the only way to stop the dangerous candidacy of Donald Trump. However, no matter who eventually teams up with Biden, a female candidate will be ensnared into his record, as Claire Gosrow writes on the website of the Center for American Women in Politics, a record that includes the controversy around Reid's allegations, which Biden keeps denying and which have not been cleared up, as well as his role in the infamous Anita Hill versus Clarence Thomas case. Rebecca Traster has prominently argued that the sexual harassment issue puts Democrats and feminists in a terrible bind, and that includes, includes those of us, Traster adds, who never thought Biden should be the nominee. Melissa Grant, writer for The New Republic, calls this a sentiment with a depressingly familiar feel. According to Grant, Tara Reid's allegations brings us back to a familiar cycle of denial and complicity, a dynamic that makes feminism an injured party too. As of now, it is likely that Biden's running mate will be a black woman. And there are indeed a number of African-American women who are qualified to be president tomorrow. Even after Oprah Winfrey and Michelle Obama, two popular suggestions declined some time ago. There are several ways to read this dynamic and the choice of lead. Some may say the Democrats have moved from playing the woman card in 2016 to playing the race card once again. Intended or not, though, the choice of a VP who is both female and black would also be tribute to the fact that women of color, as Jasmine Aura notes, are leading American democracy. At this point in time, and the light of a resurgence of voter suppression, it's once again 
all about mobilizing voters and turnout. And I wish that many Democrats will indeed vote ABT, that is for anybody but Trump. ABT, this is what I heard repeatedly during my visit in the US last year. Now, oh, and voting for Biden may turn out the detour to voting into office the first female president in the history of the United States who may also be African American. Now, this brings back to mind the message Hillary Clinton posted on Twitter on 7 June 2016. To every little girl who dreams big, yes, you can be anything you want, even president, tonight is for you, H. Inviting us to envision a female black president, Clinton's tweet may have been prophetic in unintended ways. Given, given the age of the girl in the photograph, however, we'd have to wait at least 35 to 40, if not more years, for her to turn out presidential. Let's imagine Clinton has miscalculated and things do not change all that slowly. In the meantime, hope never dies. I thank you very much for your attention.